Okay, welcome everyone to a new episode of Myth Bust Monday, where every week we're gonna look at some new fitness or nutrition myth and look at where it was that that myth came from, how it got started, and why it's actually wrong based on the most recent scientific literature. So this week, we're gonna look at the idea that sugar makes you fat, um, or it's making all of us fat. And there's a lot to cover here, so let's just dig right in. So to begin, where did this myth come from? Well, in 1972, Professor John Yudkin published a book titled Pure, White, and Deadly, How Sugar is Killing Us and What We Can Do to Stop It, which I think was responsible for first opening up the public to the idea that sugar really is the enemy when it comes to our health. Granted, the book didn't gain quite as much acclaim initially as it has now, because just two years earlier, the iconic Seven Country Study was published by Ansel Keys, and that sort of shifted the public's attention away from sugar and onto dietary fat. And that was a shift that lasted for decades. But recently sugar has caught a little bit more of the spotlight. In 2003, a review article published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition suggested that there are important similarities between the trend in high fructose corn syrup availability and trends in the prevalence of obesity in the United States. And the authors also correctly noted that fructose and glucose have different metabolic effects, especially with regard to insulin release and metabolism in the liver, and so they singled out fructose as the main evil, rather than painting all sugars with the same brush. And some other systematic reviews that didn't adjust for total energy intake uh, also found a strong correlation between sugar intake and obesity. So between Yudkin's book, a pile of review articles, some systematic reviews, and documentaries to boot, I think it's pretty reasonable that a large majority of the public has come to accept this idea as scientific truth. So where did it go wrong? Well, the main issue about the conclusions being drawn about sugar is that they make an unjustified jump from correlation to causation. And of course, just because two things are correlated, like sugar and obesity, doesn't imply that sugar is the cause of obesity. Just like the correlation between cheese consumption and tangled bedsheet deaths does not imply that eating cheese causes death by bedsheet tangulation. And while it is true that sugar-sweetened beverage consumption has risen, just as rates of obesity have risen, this correlation is the weakest form of evidence available, especially since other beverage consumption patterns, including bottled water, as depicted in this graph, have also demonstrated a strong correlation with obesity in the United States. A 2005 paper titled Sugar and Health Controversies, What Does the Science Say?, concluded that sugar doesn't make a unique contribution to obesity, and suggests that in a condition as complicated as obesity, it's highly unlikely that one single nutrient would uniquely cause this condition. And it's more likely that the totality of the diet, including increased caloric consumption from all sources, exerts a significant impact on the likelihood of obesity. For some more global insight on this, let's take a look at Australia, where between the years of 1980 and 2002, despite a 23% drop in refined sucrose consumption, Australia still experienced a threefold increase in obesity. And granted, while epidemiological research like this is a weak form of evidence, the Australian Diabetes Council acknowledges that these findings support the supposition that once total energy intake has been accounted for, per capita changes in energy from sweeteners do not explain changes in incidence of obesity. And so while the correlation is there, consumers of sugary drinks also tend to eat more calories overall. They tend to exercise less and smoke more and just have a poorer dietary pattern in general. And all these things can be difficult to measure and adjust for in this epidemiological observational research. Now there is also some direct evidence suggesting that sugar clearly is not to blame for weight gain, including a massive 2013 systematic review looking at 68 studies, which found that if you replace dietary sugar with other macronutrients and control for caloric content, you don't see any change in body weight. And the authors note that this finding strongly suggests that energy imbalance is a major determinant of the potential for dietary sugars to influence measures of body fatness. So the burning question is, at least in my mind, if the evidence is this weak, how is it that so many members of the general public are convinced that it's true? Well, I think that as highlighted in a 2013 review on this, it primarily comes down to three main factors. The first is the use of emotion-raising language. You guys may notice that anti-sugar advocates will often use words like plague, dangerous, evil, deadly uh, when describing sugar. And I think that we need to be wary of this language because this is a tactic used to sort of heighten the impact of their claims. The second is the distortion of scientific information. And this mostly takes the form of giving weak epidemiological or observational research 
more weight than it deserves, and implying that a cause and effect relationship is present when it simply isn't. And the third is the so-called mere exposure effect, which refers to the idea that the more frequently you hear something, whether true or false, the more likely you are to accept it as true. And dictators and marketers have used this tactic for a long time. They know that repetition is often the key to getting people to accept the idea that you're trying to get them to accept. And so while sugar probably isn't the villain it's made out to be, that still doesn't mean that you can just eat as much sugar as you want with no consequence. The World Health Organization recommends that added sugars make up no more than 10% of total calories. However, they do admit that they base this recommendation largely on the well-established relationship between added sugars and dental caries or cavities, since the relationship between sugar intake and weight change is, quote, moderate to low. In a 2010 blog article, The Bitter Truth About Fructose Alarmism, Alan Aragon suggests a nice round 50 grams as a ballpark safe upper limit for fructose intake in adults. So if you estimate fructose as roughly 50% of your total sugar intake, that would leave you with about 100 grams as a rough ballpark for sugar intake as a safe upper limit. Now, of course, this will be massively individual and variable depending on your specific lifestyle and your total caloric intake, but this is just a nice round number to give you something objective to go on. And I think that as a practical takeaway, while the research on the satiating effect of sugar is actually more mixed than I think a lot of people believe, one 2017 paper on sugar and satiety suggests that people do tend to overconsume at meals when sugary foods and drinks are labeled as quote, healthy. So just be careful of this marketing scheme for sugary beverages and be aware of this tendency. Other than that, I really don't think that sugar appears to play a very central role in either the cause of obesity or type two diabetes. And I think it's more important for us to look at the diet as a whole and the lifestyle as a whole. And rather than villainize a single macronutrient, we need to be wary of foods that are high in salt, high in fat, highly processed, highly palatable, and very energy dense and be aware of the food environment that we're creating in general. Okay, so guys, that's gonna wrap this one up. Uh, there's a whole bunch of literature that I just couldn't get to in this video. So if you guys are interested in learning more, I've linked a ton of stuff in the description below for further recommended reading from me. And before we go, I'd like to quickly thank Skillshare for being the first sponsor of a Mythbust Monday video. Uh, in case you guys aren't aware, Skillshare is an online learning community that gives you access to over 17,000 professional classes on things to do with video editing, uh, design, uh, productivity, business management, really anything that's gonna help you take your hobby and the content that you're creating and turn it into a full-time career. Um, so I'd like to recommend two courses to you guys. The first is Visual Storytelling with Final Cut Pro X, second edition, which has 37 classes explaining all the ins and outs of my personal editing software, which is Final Cut Pro. And the other is Fundamentals of DSLR Photography, um, which is something that I've personally been trying to step my game up on, uh, especially when it comes to social media and of course uh, here on YouTube. So a premium membership to Skillshare starts at about 10 bucks a month. However, Skillshare was kind enough to offer my subscribers three months of access to all the learning for just 99 cents for the month of January. And I really think that you guys could learn a new skill or master a skill that you're currently just okay at uh, quite easily in those three months. Um, and like I said, this is only good for January. So if you click the first link in the description box below, um, you'll gain access to all of the courses and all of the learning so thank you Skillshare so much for sponsoring the video. Uh, thank you guys for sticking around and watching. If you've made it this far, uh, you can comment below and let me know any topic you'd like to hear in a future Mythbust Monday. Um, I'm always taking requests for future videos and I really appreciate your guys' feedback on that. If you liked the video or found it helpful, please feel free to give me a thumbs up. Uh, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already and I will see you guys all here next Monday.